And please, if you guys uh, did go through and didn't do all your quizzes, please do all your quizzes. Make sure you didn't, you didn't miss any of those. Uh, those do help with the number grade as well. So make sure you guys get all those points. We have a small class today. That's fine. <laughs> all right, guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to give you a lot of time to do your course today. Uh, we're, we're, we're again, we're starting Cybersecurity Essentials, which is uh, the, the next class that we're, that we're teaching here. Uh, this goes for about eight to nine weeks, I think. Um, next week, we'll talk about it. Watch your email. I might be not having a course next week, and if I do have one, it'll be on Wednesday. So I'm, I'm, I'm really pan, uh, pondering not having one at all. But if I do, it'll be on Wednesday. And again, every course is recorded and I'll let you guys know what happens, okay? I'll probably let you know by tomorrow. Does Wednesday work for anybody? Yeah, it's fine with me. I just moved us all to Thursday and this Thursday is where I wanna be, but some personal stuff uh, came up. And so if I do want to be Wednesday, I'll let you guys know, but hopefully we can just get it done. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna go through some cybersecurity stuff together, okay? Going through this course, wait, it's really a long one compared to the other ones. These chapters are really long. They're like, there's yeah. like five or six sections in a lot of them. And so maybe, maybe it would help to, to do a week off to kind of give you guys some time to, you know, really delve into the course. So yeah, I'll def definitely ponder that, give you guys some time to take that class. We won't miss any chapters in our classes, but I might give you an extra week to do the chapters to absorb them, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, guys, so can you guys see my screen? You guys see the simplify your experience? Yes. All right. So, but you guys, now that you're into essentials, I want you guys to kind of see what's going on here. This is from the Cisco webpage. Um, if you see right here, uh, just a, a very generic breach into the into the security, we're talking 58 days of time of actually being down. When you're the cybersecurity person or cybersecurity op person at, at your facility. You're not just the only person that's there looking at these, um, looking at these issues and then trying to track down who's hacking into your, into your system. So basically, when you get a, an attack and your whole network gets brought down or you bring it down yourselves for security reasons, you're working with Cisco hand in hand. So you basically become the liaison between Cisco. When you're the person that builds the firewall, that means you're basically updated almost daily with, with Cisco's brand new patches. And so you're the person that's charged with implementing that and looking out for phishing, things like, you know, looking out for any kind of security attacks at your system. But that as soon as you have one, you now become like basically, um, you become like a hall monitor. You, you basically become this person that's just the li liaison between Cisco and your company getting updates from them. Cisco will basically lock down everything out of your site and they'll walk through with you and find out where the exploitation happened, um, what is actually happening and what you need to pat patch up. So don't think that if you're, if you're at your company and you have a breach, that it's just you. No, when, when those things happen, you're working with Cisco hand in hand to try to get that stuff back up in line again, because if it happens to you, it's gonna happen to other people. And when it does happen to you, it's probably already happened to other people. So Cisco will work with you on getting all these things straightened out. So companies hire people like you at a very good uh, salary, as you can tell from, the, from this demograph, we're talking 186 days before they can actually go through and say everything's fine, we're ready to go. This is what actually the actual breach that happened, and this is this is everybody that was affected. This is the information we lost. Think if you're like a winery that holds a wine club and you charge all of your users every month for their wine. You have that person's personal information, their credit card information, their address. So you literally as the cybersecurity person, you have to let the company know exactly what was taken, exactly how many people were affected, and not only that, but what is your path going forward to stop this from happening again? Obviously, like I said, you'll work with Cisco on making those pathways forward, but just remember, you're gonna be in the hot seat a lot. When these things happen, it is very, it is very frustrating. It is very, um, um, it is very scary time because a lot of people have lost a lot of information or a lot of money and you're the only person that, you know, that can basically tell the company what happened and explain it to, the, to their customers. 
So you basically become like a PR person <laughs> for your own security. But don't think you're in it alone. When this happens, Cisco's right there with you. We'll go down here. Again, from the beginning, uh, you when you get into a place, you probably won't be the person that's the architect. So you'll probably put on a put on a firewall package from Cisco. They do the design. You help with the build, and you're the person that's monitoring. When I say monitoring, you have this screen basically showing packets coming in and out. You can see live 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 processing of packets if someone's trying to get places they shouldn't be. So, oh, here we go. Um, so just know that you know you basically become like think of like a security guard <laughs> at like a big facility watching like the warehouse camera. That's what you're gonna do, but watching monitors of people's traffic with, with within your network. I've seen these rooms before. Um, they're they're expansive. We're talking. It, it looks like Nasdaq. They have four four or five screens on your desktop, watching things come in and out. You're watching. You know, if people are hitting your network from a certain from weird places. Um, and the Cisco tools that they use are are very um, intuitive. And so you'll you'll be actually be interacting with the, with that software. Like I said don't don't think that once you become a cybersecurity expert for your company that you're just the person that looking through you know uh, command prompts and DOS prompts for packets flying. No, you have a really robust software suite, multiple monitors watching and engaging all the packets going in and out. Let's see, we'll go down here a little bit lower. Um, Eight point two percent worldwide growth in jobs from 2018 to 2020. And as you all know from 2020 right now, everything is online between school and purchasing. And I mean, even, even ordering your stuff from Safeway, everything is online these days. So this number is outdated. It probably went up at least 15%. I would say, I would say this year alone. And not only that, but now that companies have found out, as we talked about last week, how much they can do um, remotely, they'll probably have smaller office footprint, a smaller carbon footprint when have people stay home. And so you're talking about now, not only what's happened this year, but going forward, it's going to be an increased amount of these jobs and the need for these jobs. And I, th I think a big part of the sector would be like cities, counties, obviously healthcare. Um, any any robust network will now be done, I guess, half half in the building and half out. But that means more jobs for the security people because you have to make sure those VPNs are taken care of because something comes into your machine, it can go right back to the network that way into the into your work. Vice versa, if it goes to work, can right back to your home machine as well. Let me see here. I think there was a demographic that showed how much money is actually out there. I think the EME, the the, the European, I think that's a little low. Um, America, I've seen a lot higher. I've seen 178,000 in San Francisco. You're looking at about a five-year commitment to get to somewhere like that in cybersecurity. Um, with, if you take your CCNA, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, it's, it's the building blocks to any certification you want in Cisco. So when you take your CCNA, it takes about six months, I would think, to really practically get that for you. I mean, if you're a whiz and you already know this stuff, you could take it, you could take it overnight. But to really know the stuff and be ingrained in it and be successful, you're looking at six months to get your CCNA. Once you have that, pretty much your foot's in the door and you can go anywhere you want to go in Cisco once you have uh, CCNA and CCIE. Um, but for to be a cyber ops professional, they're saying about three years is the commitment. Not that you can't have a cyber ops job before then. Um, I, was, I was talking with uh, with one of our class one of our students here. Um, a lot of people in the Valley can't afford a cyber a cyber ops person or a network administrator. So what you do is you basically wear a bunch of multiple hats. So when you're a CCNA, you know Cisco routing, you know Cisco functions, uh, you know a little bit more about desktop support at that point. And so basically you, you might be their desktop guy, but you're also the cybersecurity guy. So even though you're doing the job, you might not wear just the one hat. So don't be discouraged and thinking you can't make this money very fast. I mean, obviously three years isn't a whole long, a whole long time to, to be making something like $118,000, but just know in a lot of places like in the Valley wine industries, you know, they're looking for guys that can do multiple things. They're looking for people that do IT and, all, and, and wear all kinds of Heather, all kinds of feathers and all kinds of hats. So definitely you can be a cybersecurity person for your company, even if you're not being paid a cybersecurity role. But the more you're working there when you go somewhere else, it's just, you know, it's just more years and more experience. Well, it will transition to more money later. So we're going to Cisco route, which I will show you here in a second, how we can get to money like this. Let me see which is the demographic here. So here's just the, this is basically the entry level, right? The technicians, administrators, the only thing they want you to have is the CCNA security. 
and that's that's what I was just saying. The CCNA, it's like a six month six month course. Um, right here, you have the associate engineer or or technician, and I'll show you right here with one of these beautiful maps so I can find it. What that looks like. Um, that's not it. Where are we? Oh, okay, here we are. So as you see right here, this, the CCNA, as we used to call it a long time ago, Cisco, Cisco Certified Network Associate, it's kind of been broken down into two different, two different um, certifications now. It's the CCENT and the CCNA. So the CCENT, as you can see, is a building block for a lot of different jobs. So I would say if you want to go into Cisco, uh, like for something for something like routing and switching, or any kind of design or or cyber ops, you're going to want to start here. The CCNT probably get done about about six months, um, and then you'll have your certification, and then from there, see the building blocks go forward. Cybersecurity to be an associate, which is entry level, it's only the, it's really all you need is CCNA cyber ops, which you're not going to be able to get there without the CCENT. So once you have this course six months looking at another six months with CCNA cyber ops. So literally, you can be a job for a company working in cybersecurity operations in a year with these two courses. Um, pretty cool. Um, this little map, I might email this out to you guys later. As you can see, the CCNT is, is the building block to almost all of these jobs. So even if you're like here with service providers, CCNA, ASP, it doesn't have it, you're gonna wanna get this. It's basically opens your opens the door and window to many more jobs in Cisco, and it's just one more thing you can do for a company. So if you come to a company and just say, "Hey, I have my CC and they say I have ROPS," they'll say, "That's great, but we don't need just that. We need a CC and T, we need a CCDA, and we need a cyber ops person." So these little feathers you're putting in your hat—they're not just for you; they're for your company. And once they know you can do all three things, well, now they got someone who can do three jobs and not just one. And literally that this is what you're going to have to be going forward because everybody else is doing this. Um, and a cyber ops professional at 118,000, they don't have like a real full-time job. Like, I mean, obviously you monitor the network, but you're not adding a whole lot of value to your company, which is why we get the things like the CCNT because you can help out in a lot of different ways. So, any questions? Does it make a lot of sense, everybody? <laughs> Okay. I'll send you. I'll send you this link. Uh, this spike switch link later on. This is just from a memory board. I might just email you this picture. Um, this is actually a really cool demograph on to get where you want to be. So, like entry level, you can actually get a really good job in a lot of places just doing CC ENT work, just routing and switching, working on networks. At, you can work for AT and T. You can work for Comcast. You can work for a hospital. You can work for government. You can work for a city. A CC ENT opens the door to so many jobs. A cyber ops is a great way to go, but again, you're never going to be anywhere where you're just a cyber ops guy unless you've done it for like 10 years and you and you have a, a, a host of different companies that are, that are hiring you. So don't be discouraged. You can, you can do cyber ops stuff in, in companies, but just know you need to expand what you can offer them because people that are in Cisco are doing that and you want to be a, a total package when you come up there. All right, guys, so that's basically all I had, the spiel I had for you guys today. I thought I had 30 minutes of talking. I obviously didn't because I talked so fast. I want to open this time up for you guys to um, get into the first course, the chapter one of Cisco um, Essentials. And any questions you guys have, I'll be here with you while you guys read through. I'm going to think I'm open up myself. So I went through this, uh, the course the chapter one uh -huh. and what i do is i cut and paste or i copy it and i paste it into a word so that i download it on a zip and take it to work and read it on my lunch hour Ooh. um but i notice that it looks like we're going to be working on the packet the tracer yes. package on this this time yes. okay but you guys should also have access to that right i believe I've that course up for the through december for you guys uh take the packet tracer course um, it's like I said, it's, that's for the labs. I, I want to do more labs with you guys. Uh, it's not, it, I don't think it's essential to the actual course to pass it to no packet tracer, but it is definitely a, something you should know if you want to go forward with some, with a job like this. So I, I believe you, you can go through a lot of this course and you could probably finish it without packet tracer and, and take, and take the, uh, the quizzes, 
but you will not be able to pass like you know you won't be able to pass like if you wanted to actually understand and have a very good comprehension of, of the course without packet tracer and again i don't want anyone here to think you know that like i said this is here to test the waters for you to see if this is something you want to do so please take this you know very seriously if you are trying to get into a, a job in cybersecurity, i would definitely take the packet tracer course on your own um and learn it as as we go through here but again that's only for the labs and you won't need it for the actual course if that makes sense so to get a job like with the packet tracers doing something like that where you're connecting uh the routers and things like that what what would that be called just out of curiosity it's ccent you oh CCENT okay the so the beginner uh, yeah enterprise network technician what they call it ccent okay because it's kind of fun actually it's really cool connecting those little things <laughs> it, is, it is super cool um and then you and you think just like i like myself I, I've, ran, I've ran cable i've built the cables made the connections you know that stuff's a lot of fun too that stuff pays a lot of money as well but again when i went to the company in the wine industry what is i got hired so i could do all of those things like i could do routing i could pull cable i knew desktop support and so you take over more and more jobs with people and so mm -hmm. you know, knowing one thing is great but making yourself uh as a total package of you know of taking over multiple jobs will always get you any place especially in it and the cc and t i mean they 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 pay guys like we said a, a, a vendor come out 150 dollars an hour and if the guy come out for 10 minutes and leave leave a, leave a leave a bill two hours just for coming on site i mean pretty pretty wow. cool <laughs> pretty cool yeah he was his own his own person you know he they, the company said a lot of money going through a vendor this guy walked out 300 bucks for coming on site it was, you know, he had sandals on, a, a Hawaiian shirt. It was, I, I couldn't believe it. But I mean, this is very common. This is very common. Um, I was, I was going to ask about the um, CEH course certification. Which one? Certified Ethical Hacker. <laughs> I don't think I, I even seen that. Is that was that on this list? No, it's not a Cisco thing. Um, it's just another cyber. It basically it teaches you how to kind of use Nmap at a higher level. Nmap, what uh, White Shark, and there's one more. Um, it's uh, Kali Linux and things like that. So you basically are taught how to probe into networks mm -hmm. so that when you're monitoring a network, you can get outside the wall and you can attack your own network severely yes um and i i don't know if you know much about that i don't know a whole lot of, i know a whole lot about um like let's see my, my, my buddy my buddy did something like this uh for gmc and basically i don't know where he got what classes he took but he'll literally go to someone like gmc and you go on their website you, you can call somebody in their networking and they actually have like a i'll say it's like it's like a dummy network it's like their network that's off their network that people that they want them to come hack. And so they'll pay people if they successfully do it to hack their equipment and then give them a printout on what they did and to show their exploitations. And what you'll see in a, my buddy, which you, you might know this guy, he worked for Napa, Napa school is Jimmy Lester. This guy's trying to hack satellites right now. Like this guy is absolutely nuts when it comes to this stuff. But it, also you, you get your name put on some pretty big lists doing these things. So don't think you can be a white hat and, and a black hat at the same time. It's not going to happen. Like once you get on these lists as someone that can do these things, you are very well monitored <laughs> and they know everything about you. And, it, and, and you're right. So if you go to companies, like say, if you're a, good, a cool freelance guy, you can just go into a company like, you know, like Google, they actually offer like rewards for people that can do these things. Like, like Facebook, they were paying people that could hack them like religiously. All, all, all of their number of people are people that have tried to hack them or successfully have done it. So you, you heard that Twitter actually got severely hacked about two months ago. But that, uh, but that, that was a blast. That wasn't that wasn't a, a good thing. Like they didn't pay for that. <laughs> no, but what you know, just because this course is now open up the doorway a little bit, and I, I've always because I've worked on networks, I've done network design, and but I've never really delved into it as much as I've done now, sort of. And I realized, I always thought when I thought of a hacker, I thought of some guy sitting with like a network server in the back, sitting, writing code for 40, taking the stupid pills, doing 48 hour code vendors and 
but it turns out that the most successful hacks are either dumb luck or you literally asking someone face to face for the password and yeah. and uh, twitter for example uh they lost admin control because someone's roommate literally looked at the slack channels like his roommate slack channel and got admin administrative passwords from them handing their certifications by slack and they got hold of Obama, they got hold of Elon Musk, they got hold of Bill Gates. Jesus. Like, think worst case scenario. You get hold of Trump, you get hold of Bill Gates, you crash the stock market because you put some extreme treats out there. Hell, you could start a war on Twitter. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, that kind of blew my mind. You remember War Games, you know, with Matthew Broderick, like literally, like that's, you know, you had a couple of good bots in there and you can do a lot of damage. You know, that's why I said these people, you know, Obviously, people are, are tracking information by, by using the dark web, you know, to, to spring your attacks. It's harder and harder to, to find out where they're coming from. But, I mean, there's, I mean, there's severe penalties. Like, I mean, you, you, you'll go to jail longer than walking to a bank with a gun by doing this type of stuff. Because of just, just how many counts. Like, with the person that hacked Sutter Health, you know, we're talking a million counts. Like, you don't just get one count of, you know, getting in trouble. Like, these are multiple felonies, like, all across the board. Every credit card you take is a felony. You know, you can, you can go away for 25 years for, for one 10 minute, you know, script that you wrote. So they're trying to make the penalties harder and harder to do, but people are just making it harder and harder to find them. And so, you know, like they said, this job is going nowhere. This job is just going to need more people and smarter people that like to, that like to puzzle solve and would like to, to look at problems from a whole different aspect which is why I love right now that people are getting involved in it because the eyes of the people that, you know, that were doing this before thought one way. And now we have more and more like, you know, artists and people that want to get out of their old job coming here. They look at these problems from different aspects and not only are people, you know, good, but people are now that are trying to hack bad people are looking at them different aspects as well. So it's just an ever changing um, field. Absolutely. Almost every day it, it, it changes what, what people can exploit and what new packets come out. And as you just said, John, like a lot of times, just like, you know, the most stuff from Walmart comes from its employees, the most network breaches come from network employees that have left or went somewhere else. I remember at Sutter Health, when someone would leave, we would have to change the password to everything everywhere. Like, even if I was like, as a desktop person, they changed all the routing passwords, everything. So even I, even though I didn't have access to that stuff, you don't know who I knew or who I was friends with or what I had stored on a flash drive before I left. Like, it is absolutely imperative that these things are not only changed religiously, you know, uh, routinely, but also at, at when people drop and come on. You know, it's, this job is going nowhere. It's only getting bigger. And the more, the more people that come virtual and on, on networks, these jobs just get more and more important. How you doing, Phil? I'm doing pretty good. Reading through the thing, having a little bit of network issue, but you know. Did you take the packet chaser course? Uh, no, I was going to start looking through that. Because yeah, packet tracer again again is for uh, people that um, that want to get really really delve into this. And it's not part of the actual course. Like you can go through the whole course without completing it, but to get a good grasp of it, I, I totally encourage you doing it. And to do, to do the labs, you know, a lot of them will be using Packet Tracer um, the, this go around. I think that we'll do some labs. And so even if you don't want to do that or do it yourself, we'll do them together. And you can watch me do it as I share my screen. That sounds like a good way to do it as well. So um, please, if you have time, take time to learn it. Um, we just talked about what I might do a, a spacer week to give you guys time to not only read this course and divulge, but do some packet tracer. I might just skip a week for us, push it out. So we'll see how that goes. Just watch your emails for me, okay, guys? I'll definitely give you guys a heads up multiple days in advance. Hey, Christine, how are you? Oh, hi. sorry, I accidentally muted it again. Okay. I'm all right. A bit busy. I have a bit of a headache today, so I might be a little quieter. No problem. Um, I, said, I want you guys to have the rest of this course to just go through chapter one of the essentials. 
Um, if you haven't, please take your final. Make sure you've done all your quizzes. All those points go towards your grade. So yeah, please take this time to do your essentials and any questions you have, please ask me or your fellow students. We'll definitely help you out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. On the final, mm -hmm. um, like I already took it. I'm not ecstatic with the grade that I got, but um, if I do worse, does is it, let me rephrase that. Is it the best grade that we get? You know, I honestly don't know because when I took it, I got a better grade the second time, so I couldn't tell you. I would okay. imagine so. All right. And, and if it doesn't, then go through your printouts and make sure it's right there next to you to make sure you get that good score at the end, just in case. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. I think I might retake it. <laughs> Everyone's done a great job on it so far. Absolutely. Good job. Hey, Sue. Hey guys, any questions you guys have, uh, feel free to email me whenever you want to. So I, I hold regular business hours for this course every, every week. So anything you want to ask me guys, please feel, feel free to ask me. Any kind of IT questions, any, about any, any kind of IT positions that you're looking about getting at, you know, what you might need to get to aspire to, please just use, use my email to contact me about anything. So Travis, I just was able to pop in. I was having trouble logging in. Um, I'm still working on doing the, the exam and, and the stuff around that, I realize I missed, I think, may, I, do we have a chapter five quiz that I missed? Um, I can- That yeah. popped up and I hadn't seen that. Let me see. I think I can I was, see. So I'm looking through a chapter I didn't know we had, and then the exam. Sure, let me go through for you guys. And then, and then for next week, we have to, we'll do chapter one of the new module. That's what I was working so on. You, you, chapter one now. If you want to, the, the, I can do it now too. Okay. Yeah, I was doing. I, I just did some of the stuff that was left over from last week because I was away. Perfect. That's yeah. That's what this time is for, guys. Okay. I just want to make sure. And then the, the exam has to be done by Monday. Yeah, I believe I had Monday as for the final. Uh, oh, was the last thing to take it the twelfth. Okay. That's Correct. what I'm working on studying and getting that done. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm gonna go off, uh, but I'm here. No problem. Thanks for, so is that your, uh, are you somewhere or is that your background? I'm at the Overlook Hotel right now. You might have seen this in The Shining before. Um, I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see this pattern. I've watched this movie many times. I'm a huge Kubrick fan. And uh, the, I remember read recently the things he did to uh, to Duvall. The Susan Duvall? Sally Duvall? Sally Duvall. Oh, my. She, the, what he did to that woman to keep her in that, that, that constant state of, you know, of panic is crazy. And it, it really comes out in the way she looked just terrified every day on the set. A lot of people think that Jack Nicholson was the bad guy in the movie. No, this hotel was the bad guy in that movie. So. Rick and, uh, and uh, Hitchcock were legendary for what they Ooh. did to their actors. Yeah, to the, especially the women actors. Yeah, they were pretty nuts. Yeah. I want to get... I'm a big horror guy, so some one of my, one of my favorite scenes when the elevator opens up and all the blood comes out. Oh, such a great scene! Red rum. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for being here and thanks for Thursdays. Anytime. Yeah, I'm glad you guys like it better. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm gonna go offline. I've been to that Estes Hotel um, in Colorado where that was filmed at. Hey, that's cool. Yeah, well, walking around, there were some, you know, the, the two girls that dress alike or yes. act alike. Mm -hmm. So there was a guy and a gal there that were dressed like that. Like <laughs> that this was is, hilarious. This is, this is queer people? What's, yeah, they were kind of weird. <laughs> and they gave tours and stuff. It was kind of a cool experience. I would imagine, like, the cosplay for this would be pretty, would be pretty crazy. Yeah. There was a, a movie came out a couple years ago called uh, Ready Player One. Have you guys seen that? 
Uh-huh. I lived in a, in a cyber. Uh, they like they basically almost lived and played in the cyber world their whole their whole time of living. And uh, one of the one of the things was his first date with a woman was to watch this movie. So they recreated this kind of in the game, which is really cool to watch. It was really kind of cool to, for me, anyway. It's kind of tugged in my heart, like oh, I love that place. So it was cool. <laughs> I don't like scary movies, so <laughs> I never saw The Shining, but being at the hotel gave me a pretty good idea. And you get to the, the part where it's like, you know, you have, you know, you have horror, you have thriller, and then you have slasher, and then you have like suspense. Like, I wouldn't, I don't think of this as horror, because, you know, there's not a whole lot of just like killing, but I would definitely think of like a suspense thriller, like really intense. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like, I'm not watching it. <laughs> yeah, nope. <laughs> I mean, Poltergeist was every childhood nightmare I ever had come alive. <laughs> it was awful. I didn't sleep for three days from that. If you never watched the movie, what drew you to the hotel? Um, my, I was visiting my kids that live in Colorado, and we all decided to take a day trip. And we drove up there because they, my daughter loves scary movies. Cool. That's cool. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but it was actually it's a in a beautiful little town called Estes. And um it's a tourist town, but it's it's up in the mountains and it's a gorgeous place. And the hotel is beautiful, the grounds of it are. Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures of it and lots of uh like uh -huh. you know, um brochures. It is gorgeous. So Yep. But yeah, I'd be going there for you know, I would probably wouldn't go to bed. <laughs> every little, every little bump in the hall, I'm so freaked out. I would not even go to sleep. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> if I could, I totally would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's funny to tempt fate like that. I'll do it. I would do it. Hundred percent. What was that movie? It was like uh, the one with um, John Cusack, Samuel Jackson, the other Stephen King about the hotel room, like fourteen oh eight. You guys ever seen that? That's well, of course not. I don't watch scary movies. No. <laughs> I just even the advertisements kind of blow me out of the water, so I kind of stay away from them. Fourteen oh eight is a Stephen King one too. It's really good. It is. It is. If you like The Shining, it's like right there. I won't say parallel to it. It's a couple notches down because Kubrick didn't direct it. But it's a really good suspenseful horror flick for sure. Dude, if you like ask anyone, if you ask a, a room of 10 people, what's your favorite horror movie? You're going to get somewhere in the range of six to seven people saying a Stephen King oh, yeah. book or movie. Mm -hmm. Now, sure. this guy pumps out five to six books a year each one a hit yeah how traumatic was this guy's childhood <laughs> Pretty scary yes. looking. he looks scary looking to me like i'm sure he had <laughs> i don't know what, he, what his dreams were but i mean I've, I've i've read it you know i've read a misery i've read desperation i've read the shining i mean jesus the guy can the dark towers it's, he's rage yeah have you um Thinner? Have you ever read the book Thinner? I watched, by him. So I I almost read the book, but the, after I watched the movie. But when I watched the movie, it made me so superstitious. I knocked on the wall three times for almost four years of my life, and could even go to bed sometimes until I just said, "No, I'll just I'll just die. I'll just die." And I wasn't even worried about it. But I, I swear to you, that gypsy in that movie. And what he did to him scared the ever living everything out of me. And I will. I can't eat strawberry pies. <laughs> period. No thanks. <laughs> oh God, whatever it was. That was the worst. His dog. Oh. Yeah. No thanks. Did he write the mist too? I think he did, and then they made a movie of that. The, um, the mist with is. Christopher Walkins, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say the guy the the mist. The one I saw was with the guy who, God, I don't even know his name. He played the Punisher. I can't remember his name. Um, but the end was just heartbreaking. Oh, my God. It was just. I don't remember that. The end was I, when they were, they were in the car together. Then they only had enough bullets for everybody but him. And then he kind of killed. He got everyone in the car. He, let, he put, led them to waste. And he walked out, his own son, too. 
And right when he walked out of the car, they like the military took over and fixed the problem. So if he had waited like five more minutes, he'd have his whole family still. So, oh, so it was just. Oh, nope. I, mean, I don't Netflix, think I ever saw that. Rent is, oh, it's so sad. There was a TV series too. Oh, I'm going to watch horror all night. Better dodge it. Okay. There we go. Waiting for the next cybersecurity horror movie. <laughs> some, some CEO trembling with a glass of whiskey as everyone steals all the <laughs> personal the personal information from people in his company. I saw a special about cybersecurity quite a while ago where this guy had a bunch of Bitcoin and some kid broke into his account and stole like a million dollars worth of Bitcoin wow. from him. And there was no way he could get it back. None. Nope. Nope. Once you have that, once you have that number of that key, you can take it wherever you want to. You can transfer it to two accounts. They'll, they'll never, they'll never track it. And it was, it was like a news broadcast, and there was a district attorney who was saying that they're beginning to start prosecuting, even the kids in their mom's basements that are doing things like this because they are stealing people's, you know, money. Well, the biggest. Well, so I think it was just a couple of years ago when they had that huge spike in Bitcoin, when people invested a bunch of money into it and shot it up real quick. Uh -huh. um, when the government saw like real money being made, of course, they stepped in and wanted to start taxing it. So they literally, I, I believe that they started making like, you know, some type of transaction fee when you made so much money. I think it was like $10,000 or whatever it was. So at the point at which they're going to start taxing you, they have to start securing you as well. And if they're securing you, I don't know, by Fed, by whoever is securing it, obviously they have, they're obligated now to investigate, but then the, 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 the they're never going to be able to have control entirely over it. Cause that's what, that's the way it's all set up to be a blockchain. You know, everyone controls mm -hmm. it and no one controls it. And so by the more and more they try to get their hands into it, people are going to leave it and they're going to go to something else like the Google, the Google one or something else. Well, it's not insured, you know? Yeah. There's nothing to back it up. I mean, I'm pretty sure the dollar's in the same scenario where it's not really backed by anything anymore, so. Well, I, yeah, the, there's not the gold that there used to be backing it, but it is federally insured. If, you know, if something happens, you're going to get your money back. But in a Bitcoin situation, like what I was watching, um, and I don't know that much about it, but it did seem as though there was no recourse for this man. And he, there was nothing he could do. He sat there and watched his computer screen and the money just disappeared on him. Yeah, Phil, yeah, just I, I'm not sure you're right, Phil. Like basically when you get a home loan, you know, there's no bank actually putting, you know, a, a ton of dollars in your bank. It's just numbers crossing over. And uh -huh. what they're they securing the line that does that? Like what secure are they doing? They're basically just saying that we'll back it up with more, with more fake digital numbers if these get stolen. I mean, really... They're printing, they're printing paper money, but it's not going into houses or home loans or anything else. So it's mm -hmm. really kind of crazy. I watched a movie on cybersecurity that basically showed that. They're like, people have invested and put their, put their livelihood in dollar bills. Well, if we all put that same amount of livelihood and faith into monopoly money, it'd be just as important. Like if, if John would, would uh, wire my house for $100 monopoly monies and, and Lori said that she cooked my dinner for my child for monopoly money, it's a real currency. At that point, mm -hmm. if put faith in it, that's all it is. Well, the hop up about Bitcoin and real money, like, so the dollar, there is commodities behind it and what America's invested in. But the reason why it's secure is because there's a middleman between a transaction. The transaction is not you handing something off to somebody else. If you do a wire transfer, it's literally going to the bank. You're sending a request to the bank. The bank then goes to the other person, notifies that money's going there, and then there's that whole document chain, and it goes through that way. So it's moderated. Exactly. Bitcoin yeah. is monopoly money. You're handing monopoly money to the other person. There's no middleman. Yeah. So there is no commodity behind it. It's not monetized. It's not monitored. Sorry. Sure. Um, but because of the amount of effort that people are putting in to mine the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there is 
uh, there's almost like a sense of pride, like, oh, I'm minded by making, uh, I was actually reading on how these guys are building, they taking out warehouses now, putting servers to mine this stuff. Yeah. Like they've actually, it's like, oh, I've, I've built this. So there's pride of ownership almost. So when people trading it, it's now worth a lot more. So I, went, you know, I, used to, I used to build PCs a lot. And if you go to, if you go to Fry's now, you can't even get a video card. You can't even order them on the, you have to like know a friend that knows a guy to get, to get a video card. Cause some of these, some of these, these machines will have two or, or will have two in there is what you need to actually make or to mine the Bitcoins. You can't even build these rigs. It's, it's pretty crazy. You can't even, the day of just having a single GPU working, uh, that was about three years ago. <laughs> right. Uh, like, I mean, I, when I first started, because I have to, with the type of work I do, I need Quattro graphics cards, like serious processor heavy for my drafting stuff. So, mm -hmm. and they obviously really expensive. So I started learning about why you can't get the stuff a while ago, but I, I delved into it recently and to like to get to to mine the to mine the um the currency, you need to guess the code. Yes. Your computer needs to guess the algorithm that sets out and then you're now the banker for like a like a point zero 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 something of a second and you make a you make a transaction basically and you get a coin. But to guess right, you gotta beat everybody else. Yep. So to be right more often, you need to have serious processing power. And it's now at the point where these guys are renting out warehouses and stacking these things like GPU off the GPU off the GPU off the GPU um, and like racks and rows. And, you know, they, you're talking about $200,000 worth of hardware just on a single rack. Well, if you think so, back in the days when I used to work in uh, well, when it's new technology high school, we were starting to do 3D modeling, 3D rendering, making videos. You know, AutoCAD is the same thing. We would go to a render farm, and so basically, if we wanted to make like a movie, you know, like every like every two minutes, you know, or even a minute of a 3D animated movie is like you know it's 120 frames a second. And so you're talking about these processing all these images. And back then they weren't even like frames, they were solid objects. So it took forever to do these, uh, these renderings. So there were people like, you know, like what Pixar would do, a whole room full of just machines that would process your movie for you. And that's probably exactly what they turned themselves into instead of being render farms or probably just Bitcoin farms <laughs> and, and now more expansive and, and, and more robust, I'm sure. My actual first drafting computer, which I bought about eight years ago, I, I bought it from, uh, it was a Dell and I got it because it was used to render, it was part of one of those clusters to yep. render a movie. And then when the movie is finished rendering and they're done, they sold the computers off. Right. <laughs> Thinking barely handle my IP cameras. I don't know how the hell I'd rendered a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. When, like when Matrix or a movie like that's made, you know, it takes like you know, the, the actual filming of the, the raw footage takes like no time at all. The rest is all just CGI. And by the time the movie's done, the machines have all are all now quad core computers with, with more RAM and so like you know why would they keep the same PCs so you can see every year they probably just dump them there's no reason to keep them healthcare is the same way you know in, in healthcare when you become a, a non-profit you have to show that you've made non-profit and the best way to do that is to invest in your infrastructure you know your IT your networking and your PCs and so every two years you know we'd have a refresh you know of, of thousands and thousands of computers and monitors not that we needed them, but because we had to hide our profits. So why not dump it back into things like infrastructure that, you know, can, has a price tag and a nurse goes from a, you know, a 14 inch monitor to a 20 inch monitor, she likes her job a lot better. And now they're 24 inch monitors on, on every single EMAP cart. So, you know, you, you hide money infrastructure, which is why if you want to be in IT, it's a good job to be in healthcare or government because of all the refreshes they do and obviously the turnover. Every person I know that runs a nonprofit uh, drives a huge truck that can do all the towing that they never do. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to go four wheeling, sure. <laughs> Off road.
Yeah, I'm going to go get the Ford F-250 Harley Davidson package with the big toe thing and the doodad. Yep. I need all that. How much time do you do, son? And then know where to park it when they go to Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm cutting out tonight. I'll be seeing you soon. Okay. Take your email, okay? I'll let you know about next week for sure. Uh, please take care. I email. will. Thank All you. right, take care. Be Good safe night. this week, you guys. Bye bye. Yeah, the chapter you're on now, The Essentials, it's a really cool class. You guys really like it a lot. I'm going through it a second time just because I did it so long ago. And it's, the chapters are a lot longer. So please, you know, give yourself some time to soak it all in. Um, super informative though. It really, it really delves into everything you saw in, introdu in the introduction class. It, it just dives so much deeper into everything. Like even the white, black, and gray hats, you know, how design works and how basically the process, you know, of reporting a problem. And so, yeah, please. Please take your time on it. Please soak it all up.
Travis, I'm going to sign off to you. I'll uh, write you if I have any questions. Thank you, Sue. Thanks. Have a, have a great week, everybody. You too. Watch your email, please. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Julian, how do you like the course so far? Can you hear me now? I hear you. Um, I like it pretty well so far. Good. It's basically, it's going like, it's just like you said, going more in depth to what we already know about like the white hackers, you know, white hat, I mean. <laughs> sure, cool. Yeah, the, the course is like they said there, they're going to take a lot longer. Uh, mm -hmm. they, were, they were a lot, the chapters were a lot smaller. Um, the, this course is twice as long almost. And, and each individual chapter is like, you know, that's a lot. So I might get to get some extra time on a couple of these. I think there's a couple that had like eight or well, six chapters in them, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll start, I'm taking the course again. I took it the first time myself. Um, I'm doing it again to make sure that everything is kind of up to par with you guys and not too much. So definitely we'll, we'll go through it. How about you, Christine? You loving this new, this new course, The Essentials? So me on mute. Congrats on the final quarter. How about you? Do you like in The Essentials too? I know John likes it. That's okay. I won't ask you. I know you love it. <laughs> How about you, Phil? Liking this new course? I haven't gotten too far into it yet, but yeah, it seems interesting. A lot more interactivity, which is kind of cool. Uh, like I said, a lot more to soak up too. So, you know, don't don't try to fly through it because the quiz will be a little harder, and um, there's just a lot. There's just a lot more to take in. All right. All right, guys, we have a little over a minute left. Again, um, I'm available for all you guys for any help you need. Any questions? Um, I said not even about this course, but you know, IT stuff, getting IT positions, what you might want to know, uh, what you're looking for. I've had a lot of IT jobs, a lot of healthcare, a lot of experience. So please write me for anything, man. And, and I have a lot of a lot of great resources. I know friends in industry that have done that do network security, that do, do cyber ops, that do engineering, architects. So please, you know, any questions you have, I can facilitate some answers for you. And if I can't, I can find out who can. So if you guys have any questions about IT, um, anything, please, please feel free to ask me. I'm here for you guys and I keep regular hours. Um, I'm on my PC almost all day. So whenever you write me, I'll get back to you pretty fast. And uh, thanks for coming into the class today, guys, and keep engaged and keep reading this course. And I'll talk to you guys next week.
And if not, you'll get an email from me this week letting you know if we'll have class week next week or not. But if we do, it'll be on Wednesday. But I'm thinking about giving you guys next week to kind of get into Packet Tracer to really get into it and to really dive into this, this chapter. I'll let you know what I decide. Okay, guys? All right. Sounds good. Bye. Everyone, everyone have a good night. Watch some scary movies.